Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Eric Neal, co-owner and executive chef at Easy Bistro and Bar and Main Street Meats in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Chef Neal was a James Beard semifinalist in 2016 and 2017 for Best Chef Southeast and was awarded Chef of the Year Independent Property by the Tennessee Tourism and Hospitality Association. He's been featured in Southern Living, Garden and Gun, Style Blueprint, and the Wall Street Journal, and much, much more. Join us today as we chat with Chef Neil about his culinary roots, establishing his entrepreneurial footprint in Chattanooga, and what it takes to build two successful restaurant brands. There he is. Good morning, Chef. How are you? Good morning. Very happy to be here, Carl. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I'm really excited about this, and uh, uh, I think we're going to have some fun. First, I got to ask, it looks like you're at home. But yes. uh, when Chef Neil, you know, stands up or friends come over and you get over to that little, little area <laughs> over your shoulder, what's, what's the go-to? What's the go-to meal? Oh, the go-to meal at the house for, you know, for my wife and, and, and son is uh, some form of chicken with rice and a vegetable because we go real fast. <laughs> and that's about what a 10-year-old wants to eat at this point. So we kind of eat with him and have some fun with it. And then uh, when we have friends over, I've got, you know, all the chefy accoutrements outside from green eggs to smokers and such that uh, I love to play with and do things that, you know, just kind of I can't do in the restaurant that take, you know, hours or days to smoke or cook or, or whatnot. And I like entertaining like that. I love that. And maybe the game's on, you're going back and forth. It, it's the most comfortable place to be, right? It's, it's a great place to be. <laughs> I, I really enjoy being, you know, at the house and having people over. It's a, it's a lot of fun. That's great. Well, thanks for welcome, welcoming me in for a, for, for, for a little bit today. And, uh, um, you know what, it, I, I always like to kind of talk about, um, I have a lot of chefs on the show, right? And I like to talk about their culinary journey because it, you know, it sort of connects us sometimes in unique ways, right? And uh, so if you don't mind, you're from, born in Texas. Raised, raised in South Louisiana, yeah. Raised in Louisiana, kind of the same for some people, right? Yeah, kind of the same. <laughs> so you uh, spent a lot, a lot of time with your family growing up, you know, fishing. And, and um, I, I, I'd love to talk about when you started imagining and becoming influenced to become a chef. Now, Easy Bistro, your, your, your first restaurant was originally called Easy Seafood, right? Very true. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and is that because of what you did well, growing up? Absolutely. I mean, Louisiana is a place on, uh, unlike any other in the States, in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, you asked about what, when I thought about being a chef, and I'd have to say that it, I, I thought more about being able to cook when I was younger, because it was an important part of everyday life. And people, and, and this is men and women alike, you know, in my childhood were revered for what they did well. So we knew who made the best gumbo, who had the best fish fry, whose, you know, sauce piquant was, was the best to put on redfish and, you know, would emulate that however we could. And I, you know, was also very fortunate to have grandparents that were both in their own right, amazing cooks. And, you know, the idea of, of cooking or, 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 you know, preparing for food for everybody was, was so ingrained in my being that, you know, it just seemed natural to want to help in that process. And then, you know, it's that Southern Louisiana hospitality that's just, you know, indescribable, you know, people know it when they feel it, but it's hard, it's hard to put words to it. Yeah. So, so that yeah. desire, you know, in me was always there from a youngster you know, and then turning it into a profession was a totally different decision, but it, it you know, it cooking and the idea of, of taking care of people was there from, from as far as I can remember back. I love that. The door is always open. You, you, you've said, um, home is a place where people care deeply about food. Brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. Talk about that a little bit. I think food and home in my mind go together, you know, just there's, they're, they're one and the same you know, to, to invite family into home or friends into home is, you know, is to feed them and nourish them and love them. And so it's, it's basically the same thing. 
um, you know, home is where you feel most comfortable in, in my opinion, but in somebody else's home that, that welcomes you, you know, usually with food, it, it can put you at ease and make you feel like you're in your own home or comfortable in theirs in a way that I don't know that there's anything else that you can do to do that. I mean, a good hug is, is maybe a close second, but you know, that's about, <laughs> that's about it. Is that, is that the culture that you try to develop with your team at the restaurants? Absolutely. You know, culture, you know, is one of those words that we've all sort of adopted in the past 10 or, 10 or so years in this business, but it, in order to, you know, love other people and, and care for other people and be hospitable to other people, you have to love each other and take care of each other. And so, you know, the guiding principles of easy and main street meats are that we take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. And it, you know, we try and manifest it in different ways, but just being a place where people want to be and feel like a home away from home with food is, is really important to me. I love that. A, a good friend of mine once said, just as, uh, as a point of advice, um, rule number one in business, you got to like your customers. <laughs> makes everything else a little bit easier, right? <laughs> it does. You know, in the hospitality side, I think, you know, there are people who have a hospitality bone and people who don't. And one of the things we really search for in both front and back of the house is people who understand and, and feel hospitality when it happens to them so that they can give it back. And in fact, that's my favorite interview question for a front of house employee is, you know, do you know when somebody's being hospitable to you? Can you, you know, can you give me an example? Oh, I and love it, that. Yeah. The examples yeah. Are, are, are amazing sometimes. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's sad because people don't recognize when it happens to them. And I think it's, you know, maybe a little bit of a lost art in some ways now, but, you know, it's a feeling that is indescribable when it happens, but you know, when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. And it's genuine, sincere, you know, by it, the way, it can only be genuine. There is no fake hospitality. A, a, absolutely. But yeah. by the way, I love uh, on, on, the, on the website, how you call out your team. Um, I'm real big on that. Um, you know, just, just respecting your team, calling them out. But uh, quote, unquote, you say our talented crew in the kitchen, you never see that on websites, right? You know, it kind of dives into the menu, maybe a little history of the founders, location, things like that. But for you to call out your, um, your team, how important is, is the team to you, particularly we'll kind of segue into the kind of CEO, CEO conversation a little bit. Sure. Right? The, 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 you know, the team is, is the business. You know, I, I yeah. feel fortunate to get to work with everybody who's on the team and, you know, I get to be the leader of the team, but I also get to be the follower of the team and the biggest cheerleader of the team. And so, you know, as my roles have developed and, and, and uh, adapted over the years and evolved, you know, I see myself as the, the supporter of the team as much as the leader of the team. And it's been integral to our success, but it also makes it a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> to put you on the spot, I have to ask the question, do you know where your knives are? <laughs> I, do, <laughs> I do know where my knives are. <laughs> I have not used them in a good long while, but I, I know where they're hiding. And if I need them, I will certainly get them. <laughs> how, how does that change? You, you know, so we'll talk about culinary school and your earlier, early, earlier time in the industry, sure. but, but I'd love to just from your entrepreneurial perspective, when do you know that you've got to maybe you know, step out from the past or from behind the stove and you've got to be the marketer in the dining room. You've got to be the CEO essentially of the business, right? Owning your own restaurant and being the chef or being the bartender or the, the, the manager or the sommelier or anything like that at the same time is a challenge mm -hmm. um, because there's all these demands of the business that are on top of the demands of that position. And so, you know, I've been running thankfully my own restaurant for, for 17 years now at easy and 10 or seven, I'm sorry, at main street meats. And I fought it for years and years and years, the, the, the need to put the knives down and go be the business manager. And to be you know perfectly honest, the thing that really put the, the nail in the coffin of needing to do that for me was COVID. I, I knew instantly when COVID happened to all of us, but especially, you know, with managing two different teams, at two different places that me holding a knife was instantly useless, that I needed to manage people and manage the business and be creative 
you know, from a top down kind of point of view so that we could survive the first day, week, month of COVID and, and every, everything ever since. So, you know, it changed us all, but it really changed me in the way I perceive my job and my responsibilities. And the way um, others perceive you as well. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to help you here. How, how, how does your wife fit into the, to the whole thing? <laughs> You'll thank uh, me later. I, I am, I am ex- extraordinarily fortunate to have been able to do all of, uh, all of the things that, that I've done in the restaurant, business, in the restaurant world with my wife, uh, Amanda and I are, you know, a great team. You know, we each have our, our lanes that we kind of swim in. We try not to cross the, <laughs> the ropes very often. And, you know, while it does occasionally happen, um, we usually can get back in our lanes pretty quickly. But, you know, Amanda is an integral part of the process of both Easy and Main Street and the upcoming Little Coyote that we, um, you know, we, we love working together. And, you know, people got to ask us how we're able to do it. But we met in restaurants. We, we you know, dated in restaurants and, you know, fell in love in restaurants. And that's just what we do. Oh, I love that. Uh, there you go. Good job. Good job, chef. (laughs) So you gave us a little hint there. We'll come back to, I think you said coyote. We'll come back to that in a minute. We often don't get the insight to what's behind the curtain. So I'm excited about that. Um, um, How important is your team, you and Amanda in that local community? Do people come to see you and Amanda? I think both of us would answer that question modestly and say that they come to see the restaurants and, and, and be a part of what the restaurants are able to make people feel like when they're there. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I would love to think that people come to visit us and certainly people do, but it, it's, it's our work and, and it's the, the, the now, you know, legacy of the restaurants that, that people really feel. And so my true hope is that, you know, we, you know, grow, grow out into different roles and, and get older. You know, we have a, a, a 10 year old boy who's, you know, very important to us. And I certainly missed a lot of time in his early life being in restaurants. You know, I love being able to come home knowing that the team is there doing, a, doing great work at both places so that anybody who is coming to see us is perfectly satisfied with easy and main street meats as they exist right now. And I, I believe in my heart that, that what they find there is a piece of us, but also a piece of what's, what's greater than us in both of those places. Well said, well said. Um, let, let's go back. Went to the university of Texas, right? So even, even though you're in the great state of Tennessee, <laughs> your favorite color is burnt orange versus orange, right? It, we it won't, is. we it won't is. tell anybody. Um, when in culinary school, um, you had a really interesting experience with culinary school because uh, I sit here in Colorado and uh, I know that uh, the Johnson and Wales folks had a really cool sort of um, veil experience for culinary students. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? They did. And, you know, and as, as most of us do when we're finishing a Bachelor of Arts and uh, some great school and mine was Texas, um, we try to figure out what's next. And, you know, I had since childhood had this, you know, ability and desire to cook, but really started uh, honing it through college and started working in kitchens in the summer to make a little bit of money and keep myself busy and found through a friend, this program that was the Johnson Wales program at Vail, where, you know, you could go uh, and do an accelerated program where you only did culinary for a year and still got the uh, associate's degree in, in fine arts from Johnson and Wales in culinary arts. Um, so because I had a bachelor's degree, I could do that and they all seemed like a pretty cool place to be for about 18 months. And it, it sure, <laughs> sure was in the end. Uh, but it was a really cool experience to get to cook in Vail with a bunch of people who, you know, were also kind of on that accelerated path or changing career paths, people who had uh, bachelor's degrees because they, they had to, that was a prerequisite for the program. So it kind of, it was a different environment of, 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 of learning there. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's great. And, and, um, you know, I just love the, you know, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon sort of scenario, mm-hmm. the fact that you shared with me that, that you worked at sweet basil, which is still there. You sure know, I did. took the family there a few months ago. It's, it's unbelievable. I went to culinary school with, uh, with a line cook from sweet basil. Isn't it amazing? So you've been operating, uh, at least your first restaurant for 17 years, uh, yes. I mean, that's a lifetime in our business, right? It is. Um, and sweet basil is probably going on 30 years. Um, 
think they it, might be longer than that. May, now. Maybe more, 30, right? Over 40. It's what? an impressive operation. And, and, you know, the chefs who've gone through there and the line cooks and the servers and the bartenders are all, you know, the, the lineage back to sweet basil, especially on the West coast is incredible. Yeah, um, it really, right? really, really is. What, what lessons from your time in school? When did you start thinking, I, you know, I'm going to do this myself or, or, or did you know that you needed to work in the industry for a while? This is, this is great advice for, you know, current students who will listen to sure. our chat. Yeah. It, it's, um, I, I started the culinary path with the idea that I wanted to, to own my own business. And, you know, this was in what I would call the golden age of the chef owned and operated restaurants in the late nineties, early two thousands. And, you know, cooking was a muse to get me there. Um, but, and I knew I needed to hone that skill and that's exactly what I did, but I started and took every step in my culinary progression with the intention of opening my own restaurant. And I probably did it earlier than I should have made, you know, more <laughs> mistakes than I needed to, but I was, you know, 20 something and bullheaded and thought I could figure it all out. And I guess I kind of did, but I certainly could have done it in a way where I took a little, you know, less beatings, but I'm happy to be where I am. <laughs> so you're standing there in Vail, um, you know, Texas born, Louisiana bred. Um, how Tennessee, how, how'd you find your way to Tennessee? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, it, it, you know, it's one of these things, you know, one of my old favorite quotes is if you don't know where you're going, pretty much any road will get you there. <laughs> so <laughs> as I'm leaving Vail. You should I be a songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably from a song. I just don't know who wrote it. <laughs> um, they, my, um, uh, my mom had married a man who lived in Chattanooga and moved to Chattanooga while I was in college. And so okay. my younger brother and sister had moved to Chattanooga and I'd visited for holidays and stuff like that. Um, and had an opportunity to come here and see my brother play football as senior year of high school. And my sister was a cheerleader and, you know, it was just something I felt like I had missed out on being gone and older than both of them. So I wanted to come here and pause for six, eight months, have a, have a uh, fall of high school football with my family. And then I was planning on going to Charleston or Charlotte or New York or wherever the next you know, place was going to take me. And, you know, this, as the story goes, you know, here I am 22 years later and married, got two restaurants and my entire family has left Chattanooga. I, I, but, I, I love it to, to, to the, to the excitement of, of those in the community. So that's, that's, that's I, a cool story. Yeah. I found a really neat burgeoning little city when I got here that had just an enormous amount of potential. And from, from me being young and culinary minded, but also business minded, I really wanted to see what it was capable of, of providing and what we were capable of providing for the city. And I think, you know, that, that idea has borne fruit over the last 20 something years. Uh, and I'm very grateful to the city for, for the opportunities that it has given me. And I'm happy to have seen how much it has developed and how much it's grown in the time that we've been here. And to be part of it. I, I love how some cities embrace food. I mean, we're talking about food today. I, I spent a lot of my early career in Portland, Oregon, and I could remember um, some just great restaurant tours coming up from San Francisco or down from Seattle, just trying some stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and it was wildly popular, you know, early nineties, just trying crazy things. And, you know, I worked for a Weston hotel where everything was very, um, kind of sophisticated Swiss chef brigade of 40 it was always kind of uh, continental. Right. And, and then all these wild, great restaurants with fresh, fresh fruit and fresh vegetables and Portland still today, great food Mecca. Um, I, I, I love that connection between great cities and, and uh, Charleston's one of those as well. Right. Oh, I think, you know, Charleston and going back to, you know, my, my adopted hometown of, of new Orleans, you know, and, oh, and, gosh. and the, <laughs> and the city, scene yeah. there. And, it, it, you know, I think it's hard for cities to evolve without food and, you know, they restaurants are, re are really important in, you know, redeveloping, you know, underused or under underserviced areas of, of town. They're important meeting places for people to, to come together 
And this goes back to that, that home feeling that we talked about earlier where, you know, restaurants can provide that in, in an environment that's controlled so people can get to know each other, expand their worldviews, try something different. And without us pushing, I think cities lag behind. And I'm not saying that restaurants are the only reason that this happens. There's plenty of other reasons, but it can be kind of a catalyst and it's a fun, fun thing to be a part of. Yeah. hundred percent. So you, so you and Amanda have built, um, two successful restaurants in the area, um, James Beard nominations, um, incredible presence in, in a variety of publications from Southern Living to Charleston Wine and Food Magazine. And I mean, just unbelievable, great success. Congratulations to both you, you and Amanda. Thank and we, we've chatted a little bit about Easy Bistro. I'd, I'd love for you to kind of talk about how it segued from, um, you know, the seafood concept to a bistro concept. But more than anything, Chef, it, <laughs> I think we all know how much work the, the, the industry is and how difficult it is. You mentioned it earlier to run that, that one business. Um, I'd love for you to you know, just talk about how do, you, how do you leverage talent? How do you leverage economies of scale? Is it easier or is it more difficult when you open up that second property? And then obviously, the third one coming, right. does, it, does it get smoother or do you learn every step of the way? It, you know, the wisdom of experience, I think, is the only way I can <laughs> quickly answer that question. But, you know, to, to go back to the beginning of, of what you were saying, you know, the, the change from the rebranding of Easy Seafood Company into Easy Bistro was necessary. You know, we, I was young and thought I knew what I, what I needed to do and what the market wanted and I missed and I, wanted, and I needed to evolve. And that's exactly what we did. And, you know, easy, especially being the first child that we had, the oldest, has probably gone through the most evolutions, you know, up to and including moving the restaurant in COVID. So we moved from our you know, original location 15 years to a new location uh, about two years ago and have been able in that process to evolve it again. Uh, and, you know, the, the, what, what it's kind of reinforced to me is that easy itself is, is, is an idea as much as it is a place or a thing. It's that, you know, feeling that it's able to evoke amongst the guests and the people that work there that is really important. Um, and then, you know, adding Main Street Meats into the, into the process for me was a little ambitious when we did it, um, but it, in hindsight, was one of the better moves that we've ever made because it forced us to get out of one of the restaurants at that point, Easy Bistro, and allow the people who were working at the restaurant the room to get better at what they at what they do, to remove the safety net, so to speak. Okay. So if you know you're walking the trapeze at that point without without a net. And you know, our our managers, especially our chefs, especially, you know, I've realized in, in that time period that giving them the space to make their own mistakes, to have their own successes, and to, and to recognize and react to both of those things and help them in that way was probably the best role that I could have. Um, I found that I was good at it in, in helping people achieve, you know, more than what they were doing in that moment. So that and, expansion was kind of a, not to cut you off, but was, was that a team, was that a team play? Did you, did you sit down and talk to the team a little bit about the concept? Oh, certainly we, we did. And, and, you know, we had moments where we shared employees and have gone, you know, back and forth with, with that. We've moved people from place to place, depending on skill level and, and need. Um, but, you know, more than anything, it, it forced Amanda and I to, to become better managers um, and, and let our people do what they need, what they were good at. Um, and, and in that way, the team just got stronger and stronger. And so moving into a third concept is just allowing us to do the same thing on a larger scale where we're relying on our people, trusting our people to, you know, carry on the team and the ethos that we're trying to create uh, in, into another one. Is um, it a consistent um, theme for, I think you said coyote, is it, um, or is it something completely unique? Well, it's, it's something, it's something different than what we've done. Um, you know, it plays to, you know, my Texas roots more than anything was smoked meats and tortillas. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. But, it, you know, it, it's an idea that I've been noodling on for the better part of the last 10 or 12 years. And 
you know, want to try and get on, wanted, wanted to try and get on paper and finally did that and finally managed to kind of put some of the pieces that, of the puzzle together to make it happen. And um, so do you, do you, um, do you turn immediately to the team and, and see, Hey, this is a high achiever who's going to be with us for a long time. We're going to give you a shot. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. It provides us a, 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 a stairway to growth for, for our, our group. And we need that. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's a way for us to expand our business profile, but also, you know, help our people working for us expand their opportunity. I love that. That That's beyond motivation. That's inspiration. That's, that's, that's really neat. I, w- I want to go back to, um, cause I don't want to miss this. I think it was really, yeah. really important. So, so you call the, the restaurant easy bistro. So, in your mind, in your business plan, you and Amanda way back when, what was that? I mean, you named that restaurant because you wanted to evoke a certain um, feeling when sure. guests came. So you were thinking more about your guests when you opened that restaurant than, than you were yourself is, is what I'm gathering there. A little bit. I mean, it's it's a bit of a double or triple entendre, to be honest with you. OK, you know, I love the word easy. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of, you know, was raised in the big easy and, and that idea of, of what New Orleans is. Okay. Uh, and then to be perfectly honest, my nickname in kitchens was always easy. E. So it oh, isn't know, that great. <laughs> I'm, I'm an Eric from the late 90s. And so easy E was, was it. And, you know, I, I told somebody the other day, I probably responded to easy more than Eric for the you know, a 15 year period of my, of my life. And so it was, it had a, a bunch of different meanings. I, lo- I love the story. I love the, it, it, it's as chefs were storytellers too, right? Um, songwriters, storytellers, totally. <laughs> menu totally. writers. <laughs> yeah. My, you know, I, I have terrible handwriting, but I can put food on a plate. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. Let, yeah. Let's um, again, not to put you on the spot, you, you, you've shared some incredible uh, incredibly valuable, um, you know, feedback for, 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 for aspiring restaurateurs. Yeah. If, if you had to kind of narrow it down again, apologize, tough question. Is, is there one or, or are there one or two just, just, you know, non-negotiables <laughs> bullets that you've, you know, if you're thinking about following this path, if you're thinking about doing this, You've got to do this. Not that you want people to prevent making mistakes because it helps people grow. But if you, if you had to give that one advice, what would that be? If, if you are a, a chef who wants to only cook for the rest of your career, don't open your own restaurant because you have, you have to do other things. Yeah. If you want to only focus on the culinary and that be your one and true or, or one true path for the rest of your career, you know, then the business part of it is, is not necessary. You, Mm -hmm. it will get in the way. Um, And for me, it it was a, it was always a marriage of both. And so as my career has evolved, I've tried to evolve with it. Um, But it's, that's probably the, the, the best thing I can say from a, from a culinary point of view is somebody thinking about getting into this business is, you know, start a path. Um, and then, and then try and figure out where that path is going to go. And then for me, and, and I, you know, the other thing I'd like to say to, to, to people who are trying to understand how to navigate the business at the beginning of it is I committed myself at the beginning of my culinary career to finishing my career in the culinary arts somewhere. And I know how hard that is to do. To start cooking, you know, in your teens or early 20s, go through culinary school or not, but to cook or be in the restaurants from the beginning to the end is a decidedly difficult path. And so, you know, if you if you want to end up being a salesperson, go be a great salesperson. You don't have to be a cook first. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, you know, it's more it was more about trying to figure out how to get from the beginning to the end in a way that check the boxes I needed to check, but I was committed to being in the restaurant world from the beginning to the end of my career. It sounds like you wrote that last chapter and then started the book. I like that. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, well done. Um, You're, you're incredibly humble chef, uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, Um, you know, to accolades. I mean, I used to think that boy, just, 
taking the apron off and maybe switching over your jacket before you walk into the dining room <laughs> and, and have people just say that they enjoyed your food was enough. But, you know, there's, there's so much attention. Um, chefs have really become rock stars over the last couple of decades. And there's lots of awards that go around and, and there's a lot of restaurants and a lot of chefs. So to be nominated, to just even be in the running for, for an award like a James Beard, uh, to be the best chef in the Southeast for a couple of years running. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> some people can only dream of, of that sort of recognition. I, I'm curious if, if you wouldn't mind indulging us. What, what do moments like that mean to you and Amanda? There, those moments were incredibly humbling and, and, you know, the, the best word I can ever describe for something like that is acknowledgement, you know, to, to have a group of people, which is what I kind of consider the, the, the Beard Foundation to be a group of people who understand and, and know what it is to be in this world, acknowledge the work that we had done was incredible. And, mm -hmm. you know, the Beard Award nominations are interesting because they name a person but you know the 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 little thing right underneath the person's name is probably the more important part where it says easy bistro and bar you know because there's not a single person who worked at the time or currently or in the past at easy that didn't have something to do with that you know we all stand upon the backs of those that came before us mm -hmm. and you know to be able to lead that team for as many years as i've been able to lead it is you know the true joy in it but to have that acknowledgement is incredible um, it's, you know, it, it's hard to explain how a life's work can be acknowledged in one moment, but that's exactly what it is. Was it fun to walk in and, and, and celebrate that with the team? Oh, it was incredible. <laughs> you know, these, yeah. are, these are moments that you, you know, you, you don't get to, you know, experience in life very often. Uh, and when you do, you, you know, you're in a moment where, you know, it's a, a special moment. Uh, and something that you're going to cherish and remember for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it just, it's a wonderful story. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you've, you've sort of written that, that, that last chapter, but you're still writing the book and we got a little sneak peek in the coyote. What if it was a series of books? What, <laughs> what, to, or even just two books, right? What, what keeps you driving, you know, for innovation and like, beyond coyote the the people we work with i mean it yeah, it's yeah. it's so much fun to be you know in this age that i am right now you know i'm in my mid 40s and i've been doing this for 20 something years and it's great and to see young people and you know in their first year or two of existence in a restaurant or in their 10th you know and are really getting into it um to see them blossom and grow is is amazing yeah. and you know it, it's it's i try to embrace that as much as i can because i, I you know I, I certainly haven't finished writing my book but i feel like i'm i'm a good way through it you know at least to the first one maybe there is a there is a book number two at the end <laughs> uh, of the first one um but i want other people to be able to write their own books and and oh, that's if great. i can be a part yeah. of it that's awesome um, but really, you know, to, to stand in a, in a kitchen or in a restaurant and watch a crew of people who I know and care about deeply doing their jobs and doing it well without any assistance from me is, and doing things that I would never have done or never have thought about doing. That it's are, like parenting, right? It's like watching oh, it's, your brother on the football field. Yeah it's, yeah, it's exactly it's exactly like that. I mean, I, I feel such a sense of pride in it. I know what Amanda does as well. And and seeing these, you know, to these these groups of people grow up and and become you know better at us than plenty of things you know uh, successful you you name it like it's it's a pretty it's a pretty amazing thing to get to watch is your son interested in in, in food and cooking he he has a passing interest now um <laughs> you know he's grown up in the restaurants you know yeah you know he's he sat in the office and played with the coins and you know, eating things that he probably would never eat now because he would think they were gross. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that there is a, 
a, a fascination that he has with with the world we live in. But for him, it's the world he's always been a been a part of. He's he's never not known that. Yeah, I love so that. I, I have no idea if he'll take to it or not. And you know, I I, I don't have any desire to push him one way or the other but i just want him to, to to find his own path and i'll do just like all these other people who work for us i'll help help him do whatever i can to find his own path you know speaking of you know your son or friends or 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 even employees are there are there how do you approach i i we're talking about you know the really good side of everything right but yeah. i imagine oh, yeah. there's some challenges right are, oh. are there times oh, where where you hey we're going to go in the cooler and uh yeah, gonna, every day we're going to talk. That. Yeah, yeah. So, what what's your advice and um, from your perspective as the CEO of of handling challenges? Take a breath, you know, and realize, you know, we're not curing cancer. We're, we're not trying to save lives. You know, it, it, we're not running life flight helicopter flights or anything like that. Like it's going to yeah. be okay. And and to to try and keep some perspective, and you know. Managing people is is challenging um, mm-hmm. because people have needs and wants and desires and feelings and everything you know about them and acknowledging those feelings is, and needs and wants and desires is really important. But we do have to kind of corral them into a direction that makes sense for the business, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. you know and that's what we you know what we try and do. So you know my thoughts there are to to directly deal with problems as they come up, to not you know put them to the side as much as possible, yeah, uh, and then you know, there's always a balancing act that you have to play as, you know, the, the, the head of an organization where you do have to weigh the, the benefits and the, and the drawbacks of making decisions. And, you know, I, I find myself saying more these days that I'm, you know, I, I'm not worried about winning the battle as much as I'm worried about winning the war. And, you know, I will certainly sacrifice for the greater good because I know how hard everybody works and how, um, challenging it can be to live in the restaurant world day to day and the requirements that are put on us. So, you know, I try not to make um, decisions that may be perfect or ideal that would impact everybody negatively and come up with other solutions. Yeah. Good, good advice. Good advice. Yeah. um, Just from a kind of a fun operations perspective, you you've mentioned that parking spirits and wine uh, or pairing spirits and wine or parking them on the menu. Sure, I like that, sure. I like yeah. that better is, yeah. uh, is very important to you. So um, what's that process look like when you are, and I love that. I love that you're thinking about food and drink, right? Whether they're mocktails or cocktails or beer or wine, what's, what's your thought process when you approach, approach well, that? It, it goes to the overall experience. So, you know, I was very fortunate to work early in my career with an organization at Sweet Basil that, that really did understand how, how oh, much the front and back sorry. need to communicate to make guest experience better. So to have that, you know, that ideal set was important. Um, so, you know, in, in looking at the guest experience as a whole, you know, I, I quickly realized through some places I worked at earlier in my career that you can make the best dish in the world, but if the server can't get it to the table right and the bartender can't pair it right, or if something else goes wrong, it has, you know, your dish is useless, right? So that, you know, I really started to take a holistic approach to it. I uh, have a great love of, of wine and spirit um, and have written the list at easy for the wine list for, for ever since it was created. First out of necessity and now out of absolute passion. Um, but, you know, the, the drinks and the, the wine that I try and pair with food all share, you know, a commonality of being balanced you know, having some sort of tension in them. Uh, I look, I look for wines, especially that have tension between, you know, acid and sugar or, you know, tannin and, 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 an acid or tannin and sweetness at the, at the end, like there needs to be a story to tell, you know, just like with food, you know, if you, if you don't balance a dish texturally and, and, and flavor wise, it's not going to work. And I find that balanced cocktail and balanced wine with tension really plays well together. I love that. So there's the next book. I have never <laughs> heard anyone and, and, and she, you, you know, it's almost silly. Tension is a good word, right? Cause it oh, doesn't, it's, it's not a negative word, right? There's, no. there's positive tension. I love that. I love that. Yeah. No, the tension on, and it's across the palate, you know, you have all these fl- flavor sensations on your palate. Um, 
you know, the four senses of taste, five senses of taste, whichever you want to subscribe to, and then all the olfactory kind of playing in there. But if, if there's not attention across some of them, it's boring. Yeah. 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 I like that. Sugar, sugar is not a flavor. That's, that's one of my a, <laughs> I'm not going to tell my daughter that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, um, it, just a couple more questions. So again, I'm going to put you on the spot. You're at the podium. It's graduation day commencement. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, soon to be graduates in the audience. What do you tell them? Oh man. Um, I would tell them that the world is not, you know, is not forgiving, but it's also very welcoming to those who want to take it in that, you know, if you want something, you just have to go and get it. And, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, it's an old adage, but, you know, I think it just remains true that, you know, especially in this world and it kind of plays in, in, across different ideas here, but you're definitely going to eat what you kill, you know, so go get it and, and don't, you know, don't wait for, don't wait for the right opportunity to go make the right, right opportunity. And that right opportunity very well might be for less money in a place that you don't live, but if that's where you need to go, go, you know, you can, you can make decisions based on your needs or you can make decisions based on your career and, you know, try to understand the difference in the two of them. I love that. Tom Brady would love that, right? Let's go. Let's go. go. That's what Let's he go. always says. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I've got one uh, additional challenging question for you, chef, uh, but I think you'll enjoy this. The name of the, the podcast is the ultimate dish. And of course um, you've kind of hinted a little bit. So in your mind, what is the ultimate dish? Oh man, this is where I, I get all, you know, wistful in my old age in the restaurant business here. Um, because I want to say it's, you know, it's something my grandmother created or something I created and it's, and it's not it, you know, for me, the beauty of, of food and cooking is the ephemeral nature of it. The fact that you can make something that is beautiful and artistic and passionate and you give it to somebody and they immediately destroy it you know so the best thing that can ever happen is if you put your heart and soul into a food or somebody does that for you and then you literally make it go away that you know never to be seen again <laughs> and one of my my hallmarks has never been to chase the same thing over and over again i've gotten caught in it a few times but to never chase that same dish over and over again, because it's never the same because food is just like, you know, feelings, they're ephemeral, they go away. So, and our me, surroundings like, change, right? Yeah. Yeah. Change. Yeah. That's, that's so, a good perspective. I like that. So for yeah. me, and this, this might be kind of cheesy, but for me, the ultimate dish is the one that somebody just made you, you know, oh. whoever took the time to put something like that they care about in front of you, that is the most important dish in the world right now. Brilliant. And, and I'm not surprised that you just said that, right? No one else has ever said that, but <laughs> given your humility and your, your, your vulnerability and the way you talk about your team and your family, I am absolutely not surprised. Beautiful answer. Thank you. That's buddy. the name of your next book. <laughs> <laughs> what someone else made for me. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Chef, thank you so much. You're, you're, con congratulations on all the success. You're incredibly <laughs> humble. Um, I, I love how you talk about your team, give, give your team, uh, the best from Escoffier. I, I can't wait till all of your friends and family get to see this podcast because Thank you. you represented well. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. This was a, this is a true pleasure to get to talk to you and spend some time with you. I really enjoyed the conversation. So thank you very much. Thanks again. And, and, and thanks to Amanda and, uh, and your son. And thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Augusta Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.